Just one or two are entering. We'll wait for them. Sorry, three or four are entering. <laughs> Revision, five or six are entering. <laughs> Isn't it wonderful when people just want to be in the house of the Lord? And yes, I'm quite happy to wave at you as well. Good morning. There behind every successful man is the voice of a determined woman. <laughs> Welcome everybody. Um, you can be early or late. You're in God's house, so you're very, very welcome. And also, I'll look up, because there's cameras all over the place. Can we say welcome to everybody watching on YouTube <coughs> channel and on DVD? Just a reminder that you may not be here, but you're not forgotten. Can we open with a prayer? And my prayer is that everybody will feel a sense of comfort, of peace, and welcome here. May everybody experience the love of the Lord Jesus by the power of his Holy Spirit. May everything that takes place here this morning be pleasing to you. And also, Lord, as we praise and worship, may it be pleasing to us. Help us to enjoy bringing praise to you as you are very worthy. We ask these things in your wonderful name. Amen. Amen. I have a mixture of news. I will start with news I received just this morning, which is not so pleasant. Many of you know or knew Chris Langton. I have to tell you that he passed away peacefully on Friday morning at 10.30. Um, Val Martin, who was looking after him big time at Holland on Sea. Um, he was in Holland, Little Holland House, as you know. She just says, if there's any messages, then um, would you pass those messages through me and I'll make sure that Val gets them. I know that Chris had hardly any family, just cousins. So she um, was very sad, but very glad, because she said after all of the suffering, he's now in heaven with his father, and she's sure that although Chris was almost bedridden, he's dancing and leaping, and that is the faith that he had. It's a faith we should all have, that when we do get to be with the father, it's going to be a far better place than this even this wonderful warm room. So that's Chris Langton. I remember to um, let you know that through those doors, there's going to be a feast. Doesn't matter if you bought no food at all, it's our bring and share, and the ladies work overtime to set it all out. So immediately following the service, go through when you're told to, because these ladies are in control, and enjoy a bring and share lunch. Another reminder, because I know you're all dying to be here, on Thursday is our church meeting. Members' church meeting, not at seven o'clock. 
Who can put their hand up and tell me what time it is? Look at that. It is two o'clock on Thursday. And this is quite an important meeting because we are going to have an opportunity to vote on two elders, our secretary and treasurer. And there are four deacons who are standing. So I urge you to be here. And on the flip side of the notice there, got a really pleasant notice to say, it's a wonderful duty, task, service, can't think of all the expletives, but please remember that on Saturday they'll be having the outreach stall over in the Triangle, Saturday the 2nd. They'll be giving out Bibles, books, booklets, and love. I think I'll add that because they do it with love. And they'll be doing this for local people or foreigners, whoever. If they come up to that stall, they'll be given something to take away with them. But the thing is, we need volunteers. We need five more, that's all. If you look at the sign-up sheet as you go out of the church, we've got some, but not enough. So if you can find time to go through, look at the time slots, it's only an hour. If you could put your name down, that would really show our outreach ministry, show the heart for the community. Now, I'm about to read, don't go to sleep yet, I'm going to read a whole chapter from the Bible. I know it's very unusual. Are you ready? Praise the Lord, all you nations. Extol him, all you peoples. For great is his love towards us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. That was long, wasn't it? It's the shortest psalm in the Bible, Psalm 117. But wow, might be the shortest psalm, but it's got a lot of blessing contained in those two to three verses. Isn't it amazing? And I want you to say yes if you mean it, not if you just want to go along with the crowd. Isn't it amazing when you hear words of God repeated in a fellowship like this? They are alive, they are powerful, and they focus our minds. So with that in mind, as we focus our minds on the Lord, let's sing our first hymn. It's called Spirit of Holiness, Wisdom and Faithfulness. And you might just get a clue that later on we'll be talking about someone's wisdom.
please be seated. Thank you. I think the frogs must be out this morning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is first of two readings, um, and they are from Exodus chapter 18. This is chapter 18, verses 1 to 12. Now Jethro, the priest of Midian and father-in-law of Moses heard of everything God had done for Moses and for his people Israel and how the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. After Moses had sent away his wife Zipporah, his father-in-law Jethro received her and her two sons. One son was named Gershom, for Moses said, I have become a foreigner in a foreign land. And the other one was Eliezer, for he said, My father's God was my helper. He saved me from the sword of Pharaoh. Jethro, Mo Moses' father-in-law, together with Moses' sons and wife, came to him in the desert, where he was camped near the mountain of God. Jethro had sent word to him, I, your father-in-law, Jethro, am coming to you with your wife, and her two sons. So Moses went out to meet his father-in-law and bowed down and kissed him. They greeted each other and then went into the tent. Moses told his father-in-law about everything the Lord had done to Pharaoh and the Egyptians for Israel's sake and about all the hardships they had met along the way and how the Lord had saved them. Jethro was delighted to hear about all that the good things the Lord had done for Israel in rescuing them from the hand of the Egyptians. He said, Praise be to the Lord, who rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians and of Pharaoh, and who rescued the people from the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all other gods, for he did this to those who had treated Israel arrogantly. Then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, brought a burnt offering and other sacrifices to God. And Aaron came with all the elders of Israel to eat a meal with Moses' father-in-law in the presence of God. Thank you, Laurie. Uh, my voice has come back. I don't know where it went. We're going to sing, and Laurie's going to stay with me on the platform. And it's going to bring the second part of the reading, which is the one I shall be focusing on later. So, with that in mind, we we'll sing a song, and it's called Be Thou My Vision.
please be seated. And Laurie will bring the second part of the reading to us. So this is the same follow-on from just now. Again, it's Exodus chapter 2, verse 18, uh, ch- chapter 18, verse 13 to 27. The next day Moses took his seat to serve as judge for the people, and they stood around him from morning till evening. When his father-in-law saw all that Moses was doing for the people, he said, What is this you are doing for the people? Why do you alone sit as judge, while all these people stand around from morning till evening? Moses answered him, Because the people come to me to seek God's will. Whenever they have a dispute, it is brought to me, and I decide between the parties and inform them of God's decrees and instructions. Moses' father-in-law replied, What you are doing is not good. You and these people who come to you will only wear yourselves out. The work is too heavy for you. You cannot bear it alone. Listen now to me and I will give you some advice. And may God be with you. You must be the people's representative before God and bring their disputes to him. Teach them his decrees and instructions and show them the way they are to live and how they are to behave. But select capable men from all the people, men who fear God, trustworthy men who hate dishonest gain, and appoint them as officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties and tens. Have them serve as judges for the people at all times but have them bring every difficult case to you. The simple cases they can decide themselves. That will make your load lighter because they will share it with you. If you do this and God so commands, you will be able to stand the strain and all these people will go home satisfied. Moses listened to his father-in-law and did everything he said. He chose capable men from all Israel and made them leaders of the people, officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties and tens. They served as judges for the people at all times. The difficult cases they brought to Moses, but the simple cases they decided themselves. Thank you, Laurie. I feel sorry for him because it's the first time I've asked him to bring a read and it's such a long one. We had to break it down into two. And could I ask John to come and lead us now in a time of intercessory prayers. That's a prelude to this prayer time. I just want to quote from the devotional that uh, Bonnie and myself read this morning. And it said, as ministers and preachers take to the pulpits this morning, may they step out of the limelight into the twilight so that the spotlight may shine on the people. So Heavenly Father, we come to you in humility with grateful thanks that we are free to meet together and pray in the precious name of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. With the wonders of modern communications, together with the courage of reporters and camera crews, we are able to witness the horrors of war and conflict at close hand. We see the destruction, the consequences of bombs and missiles and of tanks and artillery. 
We see pictures of bodies being carried under sheets, the injured being stretched to hospitals. We see, too, the close-ups of the injured and the bereaved. We hear numbers, the dead, the injured and the homeless. And as we watch and listen, we feel helpless and we can only pray for your intervention. We long for an outbreak of peace, a laying down of arms, and we pray to you, Father, that you will grant wisdom and understanding to all those with power and influence, leaders of governments, religious groups, businesses and communities, that they may work tirelessly to bring about not just a ceasefire or a truce, but a lasting peace. And we pray for those in the forefront of the action, those bringing in relief, food and medical supplies, those rescuing the fallen and those treating the wounded. Closer to home, we pray for our own leaders, the Prime Minister and the Government, and all those we have elected to represent us at both national and local level. Grant them wisdom as they grapple with issues of poverty and homelessness, hunger and sickness, heating costs, education and transport. We pray too for lawmakers and those who enforce them, our judges, magistrates and police force, that they will have the wisdom to make judgments based on the truth and the law and that their decisions will always show mercy and compassion. We pray for our church here at Homelands. We pray for your church here at Homelands. Grant wisdom to those electing elders and deacons and in your time to those appointing a new minister or ministers and we pray for wisdom and understanding for those who are elected or appointed to positions of leadership. Finally, we pray for ourselves. We pray for your wisdom first, but also, Father, teach us to listen to wise advice from those counsellors you send into our lives. So, Lord, grant us wisdom, wisdom that would flow from fearing you, from time spent in your word, from walking with you in prayer and worship, from a close relationship with you, that you may guide, lead and direct us by your wisdom in all that we do. And we ask this in the precious name of your Son and our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, John. If you'll uh, just uh, indulge me a moment, I think we'll just have a short prayer for the cousins of Chris Langton, because it was a very small family. They've now lost him, and I think we'll pray for everybody that's going to be involved in the coming days and weeks. So Father, the message I received this morning was one of joy because Val Martin said that he is now free from suffering and she was convinced because of Chris's faith that he's now with you in paradise. And many of us would say, probably in a joking way, I'm not frightened of dying but I don't want to be there when it happens. But actually, Lord, there is something far better than what we have now. And Chris has joined you in that place. Bless all of those involved in the arrangements. Help Val Martin go through all that she has to. 
as she is responsible and has power of attorney. Bless the minister that will take that service. But thank you for the memory of Chris and his faith and his example to us all. Amen. Um, I thought I'd choose this because with the theme in mind and with that wonderful set, set of prayers that John brought to us, there's so much that we pray for that we need God's help in and sometimes we make big mistakes by trying to help God and it's wrong. So with that in mind, I've chosen Father I place into your hands. <laughs> Please sit. Now, um, <clears throat> as a little help, I've taken my watch off because there's a clock up there that tells me it's 12 o'clock. So I've, I've got the clock in front of me here and I promise I won't go any further than about half past one. <laughs> well, maybe 25 past. I've called the talk... Jethro's wisdom and Jethro, yeah, when we think of Bible characters we like to think of the big names, don't we? Moses, Isaiah, Jeremiah, King David, Abraham when I say Abraham I look sideways because I'm looking for John he reminded us about Abraham and his family, did he not? I'll come to that in a moment and when the name Jethro is mentioned to a TV watching generation of the 1960s, who can remember the 1960s? Yeah. Don't be frightened. Put your hands up. No, no, no. 70, 70, 70, 67, 70. Right, you've given that away. That's great. There was a character called Jethro. His name was Jethro Bodine. Do you remember him? Can you remember what program he came from? The Beverly Hillbillies. I looked him up and I found that Jethro Bodine played this actor, I mean played by this actor, and his name was Max Bauer Jr. And I thought, because you know I like to get into the Bible and work out these clues, why do they call him Jr.? Do you know who his father was? Well, Senior. Exactly. 
But what did he do? And what was he famous for? He was a boxer, a heavyweight boxer. So quite a, a family, talented family, if you like. And the only one from the Beverly Hill Billies still alive today is Max Bauer Jr. He's 85 years old. And I thought he was brilliant because he was acclaimed as a very, very clever actor at the time. He played this dim-witted nephew of the wily old uncle Jed Clampert. And if you want to go further into television, I won't linger too long, but there's another famous Jethro. Do you know where I'm going? No, he was a musician. And he formed a band called Jethro Tull, but his name was Ian Anderson. The fellow that used to play the flute on one leg. I can't do it, I fall over. But fantastic. No, I'm thinking of Jethro Gibbs, NCIS. But there's another Jethro, let's talk about him. He's mentioned in the Bible and it's the exact opposite to this character of Jethro Bodine. The biblical Jethro was a Midianite priest and father of Zipporah, the lady who married Moses, the great lawgiver and deliverer of Israel. Now, <coughs> I will point out that our brother John, bless him, brought to us some insights about Abraham. And he said, how many children did Abraham have? And obviously, even ministers get taken aside by this because we've been witnesses, haven't we, Carol? When our minister in North, sorry, Mildenhall, if you like, Suffolk, he said, yeah, two. Immediately you think of Isaac and Ishmael. But ah, he brought our attention to the fact that Abraham had six other children through a wife that he took and her name was Keturah. And one of these children was called Midian. See the timeline, see the little clues coming together. And I thought this was wonderful because this connection with Abraham, we can reasonably assume that this Midianite priest called Jethro was a direct descendant of Midian, the son of Abraham. And it's wonderful. If you open it, goodness me, the treasures that are inside this Bible. But they're things that we overlook. Now I know that usually, if I lead a service, I've been focusing a lot on, on Luke and Mark, the Gospels, and things which are quite recent. But actually, it's amazing the treasures you can get if you go to the Old Testament, because God was still alive and working, and his Holy Spirit did some fantastic things through the hand of Moses. So thank you, John. Let me read you something. We first meet the man who would become Moses' father-in-law in Exodus chapter 2. I'll just read a few verses. 16 and 18. Now a priest of Midian had seven daughters and they came to draw water and fill the troughs of water. Great. But they were also there to water their father's flock. Now some shepherds came along. This is where if he was in the cinema you go boo. Because they drove the daughters away and watered their own flocks. But then Moses got up and came to their rescue. And then we say, hooray, the hero. Who went to Saturday morning cinema? I've oh, got a few hands up there. So the hero Moses drove these people away. And so Jethro's daughters were able to water their flock and actually that of their father. Now, in verse 18... When the girls returned to Ruel, their father, he asked them, why have you returned so early? You see the little flip? A twist, like any good film? Hang on, we're talking about Jethro, surely, but now he's called Ruel. Ah, yes, Bible detectives, it does say Ruel, not Jethro. 
but many, many Bible scholars, far more educated than me, actually have studied and believe that this Ruel is his last name. <coughs> Apparently, Ruel means friend of God. Wouldn't it be lovely if we all had a middle name? Eric Ruel Jones, you know what I mean? Or Carol Ruel Jones. And it's written that Jethro is a priest of the one true God. And they didn't write that he was a pagan God that he worshipped. He wasn't the priest of any pagan God because the land of Midian had lots of strange gods. No, he was a priest of the one true God. Well, we've got all this information with a timeline of events and family names and connections all at our fingertips. And it's written in our Bibles if only we'd like to pick them up and read them. And there's another little snippet. Did you know that all this took place 3,500 years ago? Still alive today, there's still a story to tell. There are still lessons for us to learn. And here's a little reminder, I've said it before, Billy Graham used to say quite a few times, friends, the best commentary on the Bible is the Bible itself. Now having his daughters explain the actions of Moses, this grateful father-in-law to be said, well, go and invite him home, what are you doing here? Go and get him, you know, typical Jew. What, you left him out there on his own? Go out and bring him home. So they did. And Moses accepted the offer. And I'm sure most gentlemanly gentlemen in this room would have done exactly the same, especially given the fact that he sent seven daughters to get him. <laughs> wow. Moses evidently pleased the Midianite priest. And in time he gave his daughter Zipporah to Moses to be his wife. How's that for love at first sight? Moses lived with the Midianites for 40 years. That was until God called him. Called him back to Egypt with the highly difficult task to save his nation, Israel. So in Exodus chapter 3 verse 1, it told us, this is right back at the beginning, Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, which is called the mountain of God. Who loves to read plot twists? This Midianite priest, previously referred to Ruel, is now identified with the name by which we know him as Jethro. Putting all the clues together, we can now come up with the name, pardon this, but it looks like Jethro Ruel. But that's beyond my education and understanding. Other people have said this. But isn't it wonderful when you put the timeline together? Now we get to the crux. Exodus chapter 4, which Laurie read so wonderfully for us and sorry it was such a long reading. I'll extract a verse. It says, Then Moses went back to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, Let me return to my own people in Egypt to see if any of them are still alive. Jethro said, go, I wish you well. So what's all this fuss about one man? Supposedly the father-in-law of Moses. Why are we looking at this character in the first place? What did he do? What was his character like? And isn't he only mentioned as the father-in-law of the famous Moses? No, no, stop, not at all. Now, in the words of a very funny comedian called Jimmy Cricket, he would say, come on, there's more. A lot more. Do you remember him, Jimmy Cricket? There's more. He used to wear a glove. I don't know why he wore a glove. Well, there is more, far more. But, you know, we don't hear about Jethro again until Exodus chapter 18. We've gone one, two, three, four, and then there's a gap right the way through to chapter 18. Now, Jethro meets Moses at Mount Sinai 
also known as Mount Horeb, where Jethro brings Moses' wife Zipporah and his two sons, Gershom and Eliezer, to him. At this point, I discovered why he's mentioned. We might have stopped reading back in chapters 2 to 4 and missed a beautiful lesson on family, love and wisdom. So let's break this down section by section. Verse 2 says, Sometime earlier Moses had sent his family back home to Midian. And then you think, well, hang on, why is that in there? Why did he send them back? Wouldn't you have your family around you? Whoa. And then I had to think and reread, and I thought, just my thoughts. I believe because of his difficult situation in dealing with Pharaoh, and also the fact that he's going to have to go through all of the plagues to pass, also then the impact of the Passover event, which must have been devastating, but then followed by the Israelites escaping Israel out into the desert. I think it's a very wise move that Moses took to send his wife home in the safety of his father-in-law to care for his wife and children. And Moses was obviously on very good terms with his father-in-law because he happily shared with Jethro, Jethro all that had happened. In verse 11, it tells how Jethro was so encouraged by the report from Moses and how he was able to respond by saying, Now I know that the Lord is greater than all other gods. This priest of Midian was able to say that. Jethro goes on to offer sacrifices to God and invites Aaron and the elders of Israel to dine with him and Moses. Now this, friends, is a very unexpected action. Because as a priest of Midian, he would normally settle with his own people, the Midianites. But no, he's opening himself up, he's actually witnessing to God and inviting all of the extended family, the leaders of Israel. Wow. This is interesting. I want to go on to the next bit. We've had the meal. We've had this wonderful getting together, sacrifices, So as Laurie read to us earlier, the next day Jethro witnesses something which caused him to speak out. He witnessed Moses wearing himself out in the desert from morning to evening, judging the people. He told Moses, this isn't good. And he gave him this advice to find godly men who Moses could teach the statutes of the law of God and make them judges amongst the people. Sensible, wise, yes. These men would then be ranked where some would judge thousands, others would judge hundreds, others fifties and tens. The most difficult cases, Moses would judge himself. But the newly trained judges would call the people down in thousands and hundreds and tens. Very wise words. They certainly sound to me like God-inspired words. From, let's remind ourselves, the description, a friend of God and a priest of the one true God. Have we listened to wise words from our in-laws? There's always like a little titter when we think about in-laws, especially if we're men, and we're talking about mother-in-laws. Do you remember the the comedian, Les Dawson? Yeah. He used to tell so many jokes, and he used to refer to his mother-in-law. Do you remember that? He would talk about his wife, what she was at. Now, now friends, he was, take my mother-in-law. Somebody, please take my mother-in-law. So, <laughs> yeah, but don't forget Moses and Jethro were on fantastic terms together. Wise words. Have we listened to them? And that's without sniggering. Here's a side note. For Bible detectives, let's think about this. Is that the biblical model suggested by Jethro? Has it been, by any chance, adapted by our own legal system? 
Yes, it has. Unexplained. Very wise. And it's come down 3,500 years. Our Crown Court will deal with the most serious criminal cases of the land. It's located in over 70 centres across England and Wales, including what is called the Central Criminal Court, more commonly known to us as the Old Bailey. Now, all criminal cases, however big or small, will start off at a smaller court, the Magistrates' Court. But more serious ones are then elevated up to Crown Court. Appeals from the Crown Court will then go to a Court of Appeal, Criminal Division, and potentially the United Kingdom Supreme Court. Civil cases would normally start off in the County Court. Again, appeals can still be held and go up to the High Court and the Court of Appeal. Do you see the hierarchy? The way that our legal system is set up? Moses would deal with the most serious cases. But trained judges would deal with the lesser cases. What a wonderful thing. 3,500 years later, we're still following that model. That Jethro gave his son-in-law. But here's a point. Many Christian leaders have become exhausted. Tired out. Just like Moses. Because of the weighty responsibilities of guiding and leading God's church. Because they've been trying to do it on their own. Different reasons for that. And this has led to them suffering ill health, mental exhaustion. This in turn can lead to mistakes being made within the church. Even to people within the church being so hurt, disillusioned, they are called to leave that church and go somewhere else. Some, though, <laughs> suffer because of self-pride. They might be tempted to refuse all help, words of wisdom, from anybody else. And while they're doing it and suffering, they're singing those fantastic words, I did it my way. It doesn't help. Others, though, would absolutely welcome any help that could come, but there's just not the personnel around who are willing or available to step up. That's relevant. It is happening in many churches. So thank the Lord that you've got 11, 12 deacons, you've got three elders here. They are prepared to step up to help. Whilst we're waiting for a full-time pastor to come here, or pastors, Sorry, I like to say pastors because something about ministers gets me a bit confused. Because to my mind, ministers are in the Houses of Parliament. I wouldn't give you tuppence for half of them. <laughs> Sorry. Jethro was a very wise man who gave great counsel. His wisdom enabled Moses to carry out his responsibility in very, very difficult times. It also meant that Moses would not be overwhelmed, but also... In every situation, he could deal with things and rank them and sort them and sift them in orders of importance. People would go home happy, satisfied. Wonderful word. In verse 23, Laurie read to us, if you do this, this is the important bit, and God so commands, you will be able to stand the strain and all these people will go home satisfied. Jethro was also a very good role model for in-laws, offering wise counsel. But he did it without interfering. There's always this word in families when they break up or, oh, no, not your mother. Oh, no, not dad. He's not. Because sometimes in families, I'm not saying it happened at all here, they can sound as if they're interfering. And in some cases, that's true. I must say now, my mother-in-law was brilliant. She was like a real mother to me. Never interfered in anything at all, but gave wise advice and love all the way through. And we dismissed wise words to us because we think, mistakenly, that maybe the giver of this advice is just interfering Let's maybe just stop. Listen. Jethro and Moses must have had a very, very good family relationship as in-laws. 
And I'm sure their conversations would have been filled with the things of God. And isn't it wonderful when families work together for the kingdom of God? Here's a New Testament example, just small. Priscilla and Aquila, you've heard of them. They're mentioned many times in Acts. They're renowned as an example of a godly family in the Bible. They were two Jews who were expelled from Rome by Emperor Claudius. And they eventually found themselves in Corinth. Priscilla and Aquila opened their home to the Apostle Paul, no less. Providing him with a place to stay and a place to learn about God, importantly. In addition to welcoming Paul into their home, Priscilla and Aquila also assisted him in his work of spreading the gospel. They travelled with him to Ephesus, where they continued to teach others about Christianity. Priscilla and Aquila's hospitality, generosity and commitment to God serve an example to us. And beyond their hospitality, Priscilla and Aquila were also adept in their knowledge of the Bible, which I know I keep pushing, but it's the word of God, it's alive. It empowers us to know what it is God's saying. It lets us see what God wants to give us as a message. Maybe not all the time and every time we open it, but there's other scriptures that say, this word will never return void or empty. Every time it is opened, there is something for us. And thanks to that little message that John gave us about the the timeline, I saw the, the significance of what he preached on and to what the little message came to me. Wow! There was a reason for Abraham, in his old age, to marry another lady and have another six children. He gave birth to Midian, who was the father of the Midianite tribe, and now we've got Jethro. Jethro Ruel. Not only that, in the New Testament, did you know there's a fellow called Apollos? Very well-educated man from Alexandria in Egypt. And he visited the church in Ephesus. And Priscilla and Aquila offered to teach him the full knowledge of the gospel. Isn't it wonderful if we get people that are prepared to teach the full knowledge of the gospel? Otherwise, how do they know? How do they understand? They don't. It's just something that goes over their head. Not only that, it was after their time together that Apollos became an effective teacher on his own of the gospel to many. And you can read that in Acts. There's one little verse from Acts 18. When Apollos wanted to go to Achaia, the brothers and sisters encouraged him and wrote to the disciples there to welcome him. When he arrived, he was a great help to those who by grace had believed. Not only did Priscilla and Aquila teach and support Paul, they also put their own lives in danger, which is happening today in Ukraine. It's happening right around the world. It's happening in the Middle East, in India. When Jews from the synagogue in Ephesus came to search for Paul and to bring him to justice, this couple hid him in their own house and risked imprisonment and death to protect Paul. So they both served as humble family unit. And it's wonderful how families can work together to worship together and actually save lives together. So Moses, despite being the hero of the Exodus, was still a very humble man. Because we read, it's in scripture, it's there. Moses did everything that Jethro advised. Are we listening to wise advice? And are there words, wise words, in scripture that maybe we need to heed? Have we missed them? Have we overlooked them? Have we thought, not necessarily, oh, they're just interfering, but they're not relevant to me. Read them again. So this example might have come from an Old Testament story, but believe me, it's not old hat. Those principles still apply today. I learned many lessons preparing this talk and I pray that maybe you can too. Amen. Amen.
So with that in mind, I've chosen a closing hymn, a rousing hymn, to God be the glory. I'm going to, to close with a doxology from an unusual source that we may not have heard before. It's from Revelation chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of this earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen.